Great, and uh, we are recording now. OK. Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to this wonderful interactive session with Professor M.M. M. Pant this morning. My name is Ritika and the, I'm the director of schools with Mangahai Mathematics based here in India. And it is an absolute pleasure and honor for me today to welcome Professor M.M. M. Pant to this discussion about what future of education uh, looks like for the rest of the world and India um, post the COVID um, episode. So uh, giving a brief in, uh, introduction about Professor Pant, I know it is not possible and I think I would cover the entire interview duration just to introduce him, but I'm keeping it very brief um, just to let you know the extent of work that he has done across the world regarding um, improvement of education. Uh, Professor Pant is a PhD in computational physics along with a professional law degree. He has been practitioner of a field of law, IT enabled education and IT implementation. Professor Pant has been the pro vice chancellor at Indira Gandhi National Open University and on the faculty of IIT Kanpur, the premier engineering institution in India, MLNR Engineering College and on the faculty and visiting professor at University of Western Ontario, Canada. He has been a visiting scientist to research centers in Italy, England, Germany and Sweden and has delivered international lectures with about 80 published papers to his credit. With his interest in law backed with practicing of law in high court and his basic training in science and IT, Professor Pant has been particularly interested in the cyber law, patent and trademark issues, intellectual property rights issues and many others. Some of his key works include introduction of Keller plan at IIT Kanpur, developing of a computer supported learning system and its implementation at IGNU, computerization activities for the Indian representatives of ETS USA for conducting TOEFL and GRE exams in India, Sikkim and Nepal, design and implementation of student registration and evaluation methods, as well as evaluation systems and procedure for testing and examinations at IGNU, and he's associated with the project development as member committee for Triple IT Allahabad. Drawing upon his experience in the world class in, uh, international institutions and having taught in various modes of face to face, distance learning, and technology enhanced training, Professor Pant believes in the maxim that convergence between various media technologies would fundamentally alter the way learning would be created, packaged, and delivered to learners. His current activities are all directed towards the actual implementation of these new age educational initiatives. Professor Pant, uh, it is absolutely an honor. Um, this is a very formal introduction uh, of you, but in my mind, you are the modern day Jamwant, as you had mentioned in one of the um, lectures. And I really believe that you are an awakener. Um, you are a motivator and a true teacher and guide um, uh, in the sense that this is what tomorrow's leaders and teachers should look like. So welcome to this interview. Thank sir. you, Ritika, for that introduction and uh -huh. the kind interview. Thank you. Yeah. So we met about uh, exactly a month ago, sir, uh, during this uh, exchange of ideas with uh, uh, Dr. Anand Shankar from LinkedIn. Um, and he was talking about deep learning, and this was just about the time that the Corona outbreak was starting. Um, and that's when the world sort of fell apart. Um, I just wanted to know how have you coped in the last one, one and a half month with this uh, new way of life and a new normal? Yeah, so this may be a new normal for others, but for me it was something that I had kind of gradually prepared for. Uh, you have yourself said I taught face-to-face -face abroad, I taught face-to-face -face in India, then I came to Indira Gandhi University, and we're moving more and more in this direction. Uh, so to me, there are three things, because I have to be brief in your but each of these questions can be a lecture by itself. Absolutely. So there are three things which have uh, affected me in the recent time. The one is that the appreciation of the use of digital communications instead of in-person meetings. So otherwise, everywhere, unless you had an in-person meeting, it was not considered adequate. And now for the last month, we have seen that right from Supreme Court and so on, uh, people are doing a remote and virtual thing, which is very, very important. So that is the core of the thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing that has occurred to me is that this futility of various activities which we do, uh, for example, people like me were at a 
meeting by Fikki, by Ayama, by something else. You know how much money was spent on deliberating on the new education policy. Yeah. Uh, and nothing has happened. And even after the draft policy, I have at least seen dozens of seminars on discussion of the draft policy. And you yeah. know, nothing has come out of it. So yeah, I've been important. guilty of attending quite a few of those as well. <laughs> yes. So the point was that we were kind of whiling away our time in non-core activities. So I think this has come as a grim reminder that better stick to the core. And I think that is a very, very so most valued thing is please anything, uh, the word non-essential, non-essential mm -hmm. activities should be kind of brutally dispensed with. But the third and most important from my point of view, and I think it is for a lot of people, see, I grew up in an atmosphere of physics, chemistry, maths being the most profound thing, physics being the real thing, maths being the thing, and maths being the language of nature, and physics being the way of understanding nature, and so on. Somewhere in that story, and this led to the engineering growth and the IT growth and so on, we forgot that we were biological beings. Mm. The most important thing with the COVID virus has done is to remind us that we are biological things. And because we are biological things, we must understand that we are not manufactured or created in factories, but we evolve. Yeah. And we evolved, we evolved over billions of years. And evolution, unfortunately, only helps you deal with things that have happened. Mm -hmm. Evolution doesn't prepare you for the future. So Darwinian theory is about survival of the fittest with respect to the challenges that they had. Mm. But it didn't prepare you for future challenges. Mm. And what my take is that it is education that prepares you for future challenges. Mm. The biology prepares you to cope with things that have happened. Yeah. And you don't have to repeat those things because you have developed responses to them in terms of various things, giving up our tails and so on and so forth. And now it is education and community yeah. thing which will prepare us for the unknown future. And mm -hmm. therefore, education will become even more important. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, we've always known that education is important and everybody, at least in essence, believed that. But the, the reality of it is dawning upon us now because we are seeing that education needs continuity. It's not about, you know, going to school, learning something, coming back home, forgetting it, you know, uh, learning, unlearning. It's, it's, a, it's a continuous process. And that's where, I mean, I wanted to discuss with you. Um, you have worked in, in so many universities that I've already mentioned, IIT Kanpur, NIT, Western Ontario. Um, you've been a transformational force behind many higher educational institution transformations and your wife, uh, Mrs. Rachna Pant, she's the head of Ramja School. She's the principal of Ramja School. So I was just thinking about it that in essence, you between the two of you, you cover from, you know, children from five to 25 years of ages in terms of their educational journey. Both of you are sort of very um, aptly uh, together that way. So how prepared do you think were schools and colleges to deal with um, this situation? So actually, they were drifting away from what should have been their true goals over time. But as you've seen very often in change, incremental changes are not noticed. When something big happens, then only it is noticed. Even if you look at climate change, it is only when the big things happen that people took a cognizance of climate change. When it was incremental, it wasn't being observed. So what has happened is that the education system has not coped with the rapid change the accelerated change that is happening. And my favorite metaphor in this is that the king of the jungle has become a protected species. Why? Mm. Because the environment changed. He was king of the jungle, but the yeah. jungle is not there. Now we have urban complexes and therefore mm. it has to become a protected species. Carrying on this on a very fundamental level, I'm sharing you my insights on this issue. You see, what has happened is most of what education we had in the past mm. was largely driven by kind of a revealed religion model. A revealed religion model is where there is something called God or somebody omnipotent, omniscient, whatever. He know, he or she knows everything yeah. and will reveal to us as and when we are good enough to be worthy of that revelation. Mm. But there's the other alternative, which was very well written by Julian Huxley's book called Religion Without Revelation, or what the scientists believe, is that mm. you don't have to tell me. I will figure out. And I think this is the shift that has to happen. The mm -hmm. idea that somebody 
UGC, CBSC, AICT will tell you what you ought to know. Yeah. You will place by, I will figure out what I need to know. Mm. And to me, this is the big change that is going to happen because now they've all conceded they have no idea what's happening. There yeah. is absolutely no debate. They're somehow struggling very hard to somehow keep sort of, you know, semblance of the status quo. But the fact of the matter is that they've all acknowledged that we have no idea what's happening. We have no idea. The interesting example is that uh, you know that uh, in around 2008, with great mm. fanfare, we did the constitutional amendment to have the right to education act. Mm. And I remember I was relatively younger at the time. This was a big thing. Constitutional amendment, such and such amendment, this, that, and then we had the right to education act. In four hours notice, we closed all of that. Therefore, mm. the law says that if your child is between 6 to 14 years of age, you are the guardian or the ward or the parent, and the mm. child is not in school at that time, you will be punished. Yeah. Now, if a child wants to go to school, there is no way to go to school. Yeah. So, yeah. so what I'm saying is this is the fundamental changes that are happening. Things that we thought were so, and constitution was considered the holy grail of everything. And now you realize that uh, it's no way. So the changes are so fast that, see, an ordinary constitutional amendment is a long drawn process. Yeah. But just to simply, you know, one coronavirus was enough. Yeah. And again, I am very fascinated with the coronavirus story. And I want to share with you a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, you cover, people are calling, comparing this to disasters, mm. wars. So as you can see with my background, my interest was what was happening in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Mm. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs were about 64 kilograms of enriched uranium, but mm. the whole bomb was about 4,000 kilograms. One of the smaller one was called Little Boy, the other was called Fat Boy. And okay. so imagine. 400, I mean, uh, about uh, 40,000 kilograms, 40, so a few tons of nuclear material yeah. with a certain number of people. Yeah. If you estimate the total weight of the coronavirus in the world today, mm. it is less than about a gram because the virion itself weighs 10 mm. to the minus 18 grams, it has infected a few million people. <laughs> and even if the viral load is this thing, it is about total infection of about one gram. Yeah. I was almost wondering that in future, our chief of defense will be a mm. virologist and not somebody from Potentially, <laughs> Potentially. yeah. <laughs> Potentially, because this is a far more damaging thing. And what mm. will you see? It is just like you remember there was a time when all kings made forts to protect themselves. Yeah. And yeah. the force became irrelevant once you had air force. Yeah. So suddenly this entire military mm. and this thing is irrelevant. North Korea can keep on thinking I will make nuclear bombs, but these viral bombs and this viral, whether it was intentional or unintentional, mm. luckily had the feature that it is not airborne. Yeah. But suppose another one by natural mutation or synthetic creation is airborne, is waterborne, yeah. this thing. It's kind of a huge thing. So today's defense is no longer around borders, frontiers with this thing or what, yeah. we, what did we order? There's guns and so on and so forth. It is a yeah. virologist who's going to create the weapon or who will tell us how to create a vaccine against the weapon or cure. Yeah. So just like, for example, there was a time when with the discovery of these uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, mm. many of the things got sorted out. You know, otherwise, people were dying of all kinds of things. And in fact, poets said that, oh, death, where is thy state? Mm. Where is thy? So the, the point is that uh, the education now has to be to discover the unknown. Yeah. So teaching is no longer an activity in my mind. Activity is to first to ask impossible questions. I would think children should now be asking what kind of viruses could be there. Yeah. There's no need of teaching them the seven categories of virus that we already have which have been created and one of them gives smallpox chickenpox herpes the other gives this this gives retrovirus you have to ask how many yeah. kind of viruses can be there yeah. right and this is to me it is very exciting because just like the entire materials we get in the world are mm. coming out of the 80 or 100 elements which are there from mm. when the periodic table comes and so on and we can do that similarly all viruses consist of that DNA or RNA, or what kind of RNA, and then a protein, and then 
they are either enveloped or unenveloped, so there is some membrane there and so on. Mm. But the point is that the, to me the big shift, like the Copernican revolution, is from knowing facts of the past mm. to the models of the future. Mm. And this is what needs to be done. And it is quite possible that very young children can come up with ideas because the older we grow, we get yeah. conditioned by the world not to think of other possibilities. Yeah. But young children could think of many more possibilities and therefore that is what is uh, very important. So I want to really uh, say that uh, this is the main thing, that the change that has happened, and this has happened uh, in many times, uh, institutions have moved on. You know that even university like Harvard, yeah, basically creating religious people. They were creating priests. So if you knew the Old Testament and the New Testament in English and Latin, <laughs> you were a graduate. Yeah. And I read this somewhere very interesting. So because when the settlers came to New mm. England, this was what was needed. But mm. when the jobs in the churches got full, they mm. realized that now they can no longer teach this. So they did some yeah. research and found out new stuff to teach and create it. So what I'm trying to say now is that in terms of knowledge which is already there, Mm -hmm. That will go into automated systems. So there will be chatbots and AI and so on. Yeah. So there is no point in humans relearning all those facts because they will be available at cost. Yeah. What is going to be is at least till the next stability cycle comes, mm -hmm. in the next 10-15 years, we mm -hmm. are at this kind of a new world where you cannot tell. See, you can tell us to be under lockdown. But you can't tell viruses not to be evolving, not to yeah. be changing, and so yeah. on and so forth. So yeah. this is what is going to be very important. And therefore, the whole thing, which we have often talked about project-based learning, discovery learning, etc. But that mm. was usually seen as something esoteric and not really needed. But that is mm. going to become more and more fundamental. And uh, here again, the metaphor of Jambans actually comes in right here. Because you still have, you have the seeds of creativity. Seeds of learning. You learn yeah. to walk by yourself, you learn to run by yourself, you learn to hold language by yourself without any formally teaching you. Yeah. And therefore, the whole idea is that we should be able to create uh, an atmosphere where learning is enjoyable mm -hmm. and learning becomes your ikigai. So when you wake up in the morning, you yeah. have to learn something new. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on. I mean, you, I'm a professor, I can keep on talking. So no, I, but Absolutely. This is, uh, I mean, exactly what I was trying to get to. I think in essence, this is a this is a great opportunity for students to explore what is it that they can do more. But my bigger uh, worry is the teachers and the principals who are at this point finding themselves at a at a great disadvantage because no B.Ed college, no training ever prepared them for distance learning. Uh, principles, a lot of the principles that I've met and interacted with recently said that, you know, up until now, our biggest worry was, um, are the buses coming on time? Are they leaving on time? And, you know, uh, are the, our children safe and all of that? All of that has gone away right. just like that. Um, but the fact is they still have to ensure learning is happening. They still have to ensure that certain metrics are being met. Assessments are there. Uh, I think our focus is more still more on assessments and less on the fact that assessments are for the purpose of improving learning. Um, even parents are saying how many marks, kitne exam mein, how well is our child doing rather than saying is the learning happening. So what is your what is your recommendation for principals and so, teachers? So, I think the, uh, so my uh, very pragmatic thing is that here is the right time to start changing tracks a little bit. Yeah. And what I'm saying is we can't simply give up this thing and go on because, as you said, there's a huge residual thing. Yeah. So I am recommending to people, uh, you are familiar with this, called the Pareto principle or 80-20 ratio. Yeah. So yeah. I'm saying be conformist to 80%. Mm -hmm. Don't spend all your energy and more mm -hmm. on conformist. So don't mm -hmm. go to buy you an extra marks and so on so forth to get more marks. If yeah. you got, you've done a good job, got good marks, be happy. And yeah. then spend 20% on yeah. the core stuff. Yeah. So you will get a reasonably good grade. You will get a grade. This thing you will be socially acceptable, but you mm. will also be in the right direction. Mm. Whereas if you put all your energy mm. in trying to get the maximum mark, you mm. would have lost out on everything else. 
So this is a to me a very pragmatic thing. And fortunately, in this Corona thing, yeah. self learning, online learning, resource based learning has been brought in. So yeah. instead of throwing it away now, you mm. keep it. So you mm. say that 80% we will be conformist because we don't want to break the social order. We don't want to say CBSC is nonsense. Yeah. We say fine, we'll do the marks for you. But I will mm. also become a seeker of learning. I will enjoy learning. I will enjoy it. I have done this for you because you asked for it. Yeah. And yeah. what you ask for a in a three-hour exam cannot mm. be the goal of my life. So mm. I will do what you are saying. I will not be a rebel and say I will not go to school. This, that, that, that. But in fact, you must have also heard the other phrase that's called single loop learning and double loop learning. Uh, mm. So double loop learning is about knowing the goal of why you are learning. And if right. that goal changes, you change it. So single loop learning is this is the outcome goal. You are learning oh. for it. But the mm. double loop learning is but why this goal? Mm. So, so you say CBSE to me was single loop learning. I did this to get marks in CBSE. But mm. I want to know. I want to be able to think. I want to be able to apply ideas across disciplines. Yeah. So one of the big things about traditional education is the silos. Mm. But the future is about going across disciplines, yeah. and uh, the convergence of disciplines, etc., that will happen. And therefore, mm. I would suggest to people to look at the Pareto principle and try to get that. And you know that. If you do that, you will be, in a sense, getting best of both the worlds. Yeah, and by that you mean that even parents need to be sort of onboarded because I mean, yeah, parents, yeah, parents, are, yeah. parents have to be there. In fact, this is a uh, very amazing thing that all that we have been looking for is that taking parents for a ride. Parents mm. have wrong conceptions. Instead of trying to rectify those conceptions. We are saying, okay, fine. So if this is what you like, we will give this, and yeah. that is not the right approach. I have had this debate several times with people who try to tell me about the market and the parent. I said, see, parents may want it, but I, as an educator, I know this is not right. I would mm. not do it for my child. I would not do it for my grandchild. So why will I do it for his child? If he wants to do it without any relation, uh, sort of reference to me, that is fine. But mm. I cannot be party. To his things which are wrong. I mean, if somebody tells you that two plus two is five, will you mm. agree with him just because he is paying you money? <laughs> right? He says two plus two is four. If you yeah. want vector, it can be a little bit different. It will depend upon the angle between the two vectors. But it cannot do it. So you cannot agree with somebody. If the, see the the whole point is this is actually at one time in social structures this is called noblesse oblige. That if you were an enlightened noble, it was your role to tell others about it. Yeah. It was not to fleece their ignorance. If the person yeah. is ignorant, you don't take advantage of him. You try to inform him. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what Socratic thing was all about. That you try to get them into the right. I think it is very important that rather than this thing has come from a bad marketing idea because he is paying the money. Therefore, whatever he says, you do. And yeah. Uh, so therefore, there. But I think as educators, it is your uh, responsibility to make them aware of it. Uh, get them to understand, get them to your way of thinking, whatever. Great. So this uh, takes us very well into the next point, which I wanted to discuss, which is uh, you've done extensive work in the area of developing thinking human capital through personalized and inclusive education. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about it and how to practically implement this as an educator? Yeah. So first thing is that uh, the very famous Stanford professor Eric Hanushek. He has a book called The Cognitive Capital of Nations, and okay. he tried to give the title and analogy to Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. And what he says there is whether it is individuals or communities or groups or nations, mm -hmm. the higher the level of education, the better off they are economically. It also happens in regions. For example, the Silicon Valley consists of all people who are highly educated, highly competitive, highly entrepreneurial, and therefore California alone is much richer than many other states. Then mm. comes countries and so on. So this is something which is very important because many other people, like Amartya Sain or our Abhijit Mani, they have been at the other spectrum that from uneducated to educated, and that mm. will lead to great things and therefore educating them. But what they're saying is it's not just uneducated to educated, it is how well educated you are or how deeply educated you are that makes a big difference. Mm. So cognitive capital is basically arising out of that. And right. the point was that a few decades ago, mm -hmm. 
it did not matter because society's operating level at economy and so on was a much lower, lower level than the frontiers of knowledge. Yeah. So if you were at the frontiers of knowledge, the normal trader, businessman had no role for you. Mm. But today things have changed. What is at the frontiers of knowledge is turning to economic thing very quickly. Mm. Look at all the big companies. It is because they've done research, because they have patents, because they have whatever uh, trained manpower that they are able to lead. Mm. And therefore, what Eric Hanushek says is not. Now, the implementation of this is very simple. The implementation of this is just like you would do anything. Any See, all financial people tell you how to accumulate wealth, how yeah. to build your assets. Yeah. Uh, there is a very nice book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which talks mm. about assets and liabilities. There's also yeah. a book by an Indian lady which takes less stock money. So mm. the point is, if you put this analogy of assets and liabilities, you can put it for your knowledge. Mm. So you're acquiring an asset, which will be mm. returned over time, or is it just a liability that I will have this, but then I will get nothing out of it. And yeah. Benjamin Franklin said this long ago, that an investment in education pays the best interest. And mm. people may not have read about Benjamin Franklin's quote, but Amitabh Bachchan recently has said this, that his father told him, that education is the best investment. Mm. Some videos people see in much larger number. <laughs> so, so the point is, it has always been agreed, but the point at that time was that it wasn't for many people to realize the benefits of the thing. And but today it is no longer. Today, people who are doing fundamental research are also getting patent. They are also logical, they are also getting funding, and they are trusted. So the point is that the Shift that has to happen is earlier the idea was that we have a set of people who are completely ignorant and mm -hmm. we have given them some minimal education, compulsory education, etc. Et now that can continue to be that way, but each individual's responsibility is to rise to its full potential. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, today people don't uh, read things like that, but Milton has a very nice poem on his blindness. So uh, Milton, you know, was blind and he was a poet and he he, so that poem is called Lament. And in Lament, he says that, you know, does God exact day labor like denied? And, so, and that one talent, which is dead to hide, is all with me useless, though my soul more sense. And then he goes on to say, God, uh, they also serve who only stand and wait. So the idea that if I am talented, I must not waste my talent, it has to be implemented that I must nurture my talent. Ken Robinson has used the word element for it. Mm -hmm. Element is where your aptitude meets your passion. So instead of doing all those whatever five papers and 25 things and answering that, which you do, as I said, part of 80% of your role, but 20% should be to make yourself unique. Yeah. You have to make yourself unique. I recently read something where he compared five very successful people, and he said that all of them, so he has this idea that all of them are voracious readers, and all mm -hmm. of them are polymaths. By polymaths, mm -hmm. it means that they are good in at least three fields. Mm. And this is what the idea of uh, developing yourself is. So when you become in a thing like this, I'd use a word which is used in law called sui generis. Sui generis is used in law to say in a class of its own. Mm. Everybody mm. must endeavor to become somebody in a class of its own or what mm. you might call the go-to person. So for mm. this thing, you must go to that person. If yeah. you create that, that is more important than being part of uh, hundreds or thousands of people who will appear before the Public Service Commission or something else and appear for an interview to get a job and be very thankful that they were given a job. They should actually be sought for the task. Yeah. And it's not all that difficult. It's perfectly doable. And it is very simple that instead of trying to be like everybody else, why don't you try to become a better version of you? Yeah. No, I agree. I think this is where the 20% or that uh, that uniqueness of every individual will shine through when they actually try to nurture what is their innate potential. But for the 80% so that needs some bit of external motivation. I mean, the 20% will come somewhere internally, right? It has to be intrinsically driven. But the external motivation to be able to get through what what as a society we are expecting our children to get through. How can educators ensure that that see, motivation? By, by explaining why, see, it is very simple. Uh, you know the biggest thing that happens 
are mm. storytelling and examples. Mm. Now, the point is, there was a time when we didn't have examples of people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Steve Jobs and so on that we talk. Because if we talk only of gifted scientists, mathematicians, or people in literature, that doesn't inspire common people. Common exactly. people want success in the material world. Mm -hmm. So that Galua did some great mathematics when he was 22 and then committed suicide in a duel. Nobody will enjoy that, right? But when you talk about, so today we fortunately have, and that's why the idea of cognitive capital and wealth is, that today you are saying that learning can also lead to good earning. Earlier, it wasn't so. Earlier, the idea was that if you knew a lot of things at the fine end, who cares if you knew number theory, if you knew set theory. Now, you know, number theory is very much needed in all cryptographic systems and so on and so forth. So if I am a mathematician working with prime numbers and when will the next prime number come, there was no opportunity for me. But yeah. today it is. Today you are fighting against for better cryptographic systems. So today it is not so difficult to mm. do that. And uh, I'm a great believer that these things should be uh, in some sense shared and talked about. Yeah, yeah. So that makes sense from both an educator perspective and as a learner, I'm also trying to figure out why like, I'm at home and I'm doing multiple things which I never got the opportunity to do at home. But how do I also continue to keep myself relevant? What what do I need to focus on in terms of learning, having my books handy so that, uh, you know, I'm making the most of this time and I don't complain that, you know, I'd never get time to read and things like that. But um, since our common area of interest is mathematics, I wanted to uh, understand from you the, the most important um, concern that I'm hearing from parents and teachers is that, you know, maths, metho, maths is anyway a, a problem subject for our kids. Now, if there is a four or five months gap or six months gap, or we don't know when the children are coming back, um, how are we going to handle that gap in mathematics? Uh, you know, in a class, you get a lot of biofeedback, right? As a teacher, you know, some child is yawning, somebody is looking out, you understand whether the lesson is engaging or not. Whereas in an online live lesson, it is very hard. I mean, technology, while it makes it easy to get everybody together, it's very difficult in the current scenario for teachers to understand, you know, what is happening and get get a sense of the class. So what, what what would you say would be the short term and long term strategies to ensure that mathematics doesn't suffer or children don't suffer, uh, you know, their continuum of learning math? Yeah, see, the, the problem is children are suffering because of the traditional way math is being taught in class. So for any reduction in that is going to be something for the better. So that is the thing. See, the, the problem is, and uh, the way maths is taught, uh, there are two things. First, uh, the teachers don't create an enthusiasm for the subject. They try mm -hmm. to continue to create the mystique about it and the difficulty about it, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that for many of them, maybe they themselves don't love maths. And they're doing this because they happen to do this and they're doing it. Uh, there's a very nice TED talk uh, by Conrad Wolfram, whose mm. title is Let Us Stop Teaching Calculating, Let Us Teach Them Mathematics. So firstly, the whole problem of mathematics being synonymous with calculation mm. has to be given away. You can be a great mathematician and a very poor calculator. Mm. Absolutely no question. So I think the whole problem that is happening, it is like saying for literature, a good handwriting is very important. Mm. So handwriting has nothing to do with being a literary person. Mm. So similarly, calculations have nothing to do with being a mathematician. And yeah. people should accept the idea that calculation is a separate process. And Conrad Wolfram has done it very well. He's talked about the four stages of a mathematical problem. And mm. he said most important is to express it in the language of maths. Okay. To do the abstraction, which mm. is the essence of the problem. So you are given a, uh, there is a field which is this and so on, and I want to do. Now you have to say, I don't care how many cows are grazing, how many sheep are grazing. I am interested in the dimensions of the field. That's abstraction. It is also something which we talk about in computational thinking. Also essential part. Now instead of that, what happens is that we kind of train these people that you're given a set of numbers, you do some operations between them and you will get an answer. Mm. So that is the least important part and is actually the distracting part. 
plan. Mm. So I think one of the important things is to start understanding. So they should just give a problem and to express this in terms of this. So what sometimes is called a word problem and put it to a mathematical shape, etc. The second thing is there should be creating the joy of mathematics. Now, there are mathematics come in, in my view, by reading lives of mathematics. Mm -hmm. I can imagine an education where you're doing all this and mm -hmm. you're telling them anything about the same math was all done by humans. Yeah. And therefore, how did they go about? Why did they go about? Is something which is very important. And in fact, it's not only for math, for all fields. <laughs> I often find I meet people in certain areas of psychology and I ask them who are the great sports psychologists, they have no idea. They won't be done what is in the curriculum, what you can have been told in B8, etc. So, but why did mathematicians need to do something beyond what mathematicians had done earlier? Yeah. And I think unless this continuity is brought in, and mm -hmm. just the set of topics are there and this thing and you will do this, you get 99 or 100. Uh, you may get that part, but that doesn't mean that you have enjoyed it or had a love for it. So teaching about the people is very important. And in fact, I remember very young, uh, mm -hmm. I don't understand Galois theory, but I know about Galois. Mm -hmm. The whole idea that you are knowing about people who did these things is more important. And when you look into those stories, you see there's a fair amount of uh, uh, progress, understanding how it evolved. And mm. let one understand. Also, I am a great believer in the field of what is happening. People assume mathematics is done and over. Mm. It is not so. There is 21st century math. Mm. I, and I've been crying hoarse with people that why don't you introduce children to topology? Why are you still talking them two-dimensional plane geometry? Mm. The reason is that many teachers themselves don't want to learn. They're mm -hmm. comfortable. But tomorrow's children will be very handicapped if they won't have an understanding of topology because the way you look at AI, multidimensional analysis, etc., or you look at many of the other things, uh, Microsoft has got a field of mathematics, uh, a field medalist, the field mm -hmm. of topology for their yep. work on computing. So the point that I'm trying to make is that it's about the language. So uh, I come from physics. I'm a great admirer of Feynman. So Feynman says that mathematics is the language of nature. If you want to understand nature, you cannot ask nature to speak in another language for you. So mm. you have to be able. So nature is not about organic farming. Nature is about how things behave, how things work, what are the forces, etc. And nature speaks in the language of mathematics. So the, uh, there are various things, but the important point is that uh, to say why you are learning math is very important and to distinguish between, see, like we distinguish between computer science and programming. Yeah. Right. So people yeah. should understand calculation or I said handwriting and literature. Mm. So I could be a great literary person who cannot write by hand at all. Mm. Or I may stammer while speaking. I could still be a great literary person. I could be a great mathematician, and there were mathematicians who could not do simple arithmetic problems. <laughs> they were looking at fundamental issues and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I think uh, that's quite a lot for all of us to take in. I'll just summarize some points. I think one of the one of the things that you said is uh, setting the context, answering the why. You know, why are we learning something now that we as educators also have the time? Why not utilize this time in answering that why uh, for children and let them uh, empower them and let them um, continue their own learning journey. Um, the Pareto principle, 80-20, let's stick to what we know and stick to our comfort zone 80% of the times, but take the leap of faith 20% of the times. I think uh, this is a great takeaway for, for me personally as well. Um, but just any parting thoughts, any parting wisdom, I cannot yeah. let you go without uh, without hearing more of your gyan. Uh, I mean, no, I, I, wish want to, I want to share two points which I think are very important. Yeah. One is we have to orient people towards appreciating and dealing with complexity. One of the problems we have is we simplify things for people. 
We say made easy, simplify. That is not the challenge. The thing is, you have to make them understand how complex the thing is, mm -hmm. and what is complexity, and how you unravel complexity mm -hmm. to understand. Because this is what the world is about. The world at a basic level is very simple, but as you go on, so we, for example, are a very complex. Or we are, for I think, forty trillion cells working mm -hmm. together in each of us. Mm. Our brain is a very complex system. Our thing is a very complex system. Uh, so the idea that I will simplify things for you so that it's a simple cause and effect and a simple mm. proportional ratio and proportional relationship is not true. So this is what is very important. That like, and as you understand more complexities, you'll appreciate the complexity in the financial market. You will understand it in the economic market. You will understand it in the employment market. Will understand it in the plants and leaves and nature that you see around. The other very important thing is that we need to develop foresight. This whole mm -hmm. idea that we know the past, we'll tell you, and you will meet exactly that same thing in future is not right. Mm -hmm. My past is not your future. Mm -hmm. Your future and my future are both unknown. Yeah. <laughs> and therefore, we may be living in the same time with different uh, backgrounds. Uh, and therefore, developing foresight is very important. Mm -hmm. And developing foresight does not mean perfect foresight. Mm -hmm. The next few things, like in calculus, we use uh, delta x, delta y, yeah. delta t. Can you foresee your delta t's and delta y's? What mm -hmm. is happening to you? And it is very important because when I say this in calculus terms, you will, as a mathematician, understand. But I also like it in very poetic terms because one of my favorite things on this is a thing from Mahatma Gandhi. So Mahatma Gandhi likes something very much which was written by Paul Newman. Uh, it's a very famous thing called Lead Kindly Light. It goes on like Lead Kindly Light, Lead Thou Me On. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a phrase of God or whatever, but it says, I do not ask to see the distant scene. Mm -hmm. One step more is enough for me. And that is what I'm trying to say. So don't say that I will understand it. See, <laughs> I will share with you two quick stories. Mm -hmm. Winston Churchill, during the war, when uh, these people had won and defeated Germany and so on and so forth, was very excited in a speech in parliament he made. I mm -hmm. sometimes quote that in detail. He said that even if this empire were to last for a thousand years, mm -hmm. people would say this was their finest hour. This is one of Churchill's famous speeches. This was their finest hour. Yet, other very nice quotation, never before had so many owed so much to so few, and so on. But imagine yeah. in 1945 or so, he was thinking that they no, will no. rule for another thousand years. Wow. Those are home. Much fan was made of Abdul Kalam's book, India 2020. Mm. Now you read that book and see where India is in 2020. Right. At that time, India will become a superpower, it will become a this thing, this thing, this thing. Yeah. So, long term future predictions are very difficult. Yeah. There's a very famous economist called Keynes. He never liked long term predictions. He said, in the long term, we will all be dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> incremental, as things stand today. Right. What is it that we can expect? So, in fact, if you remember in education, a lot of people talk about 21st century, but I say, Three, two, one, third decade of the 21st century. I can mm. only anticipate the next 10 years. That also not very accurately. But to mm. say for the whole century, this will happen is a completely mistaken. So I think these are two important things to understand complexity, to mm. be able to foresee the future things, a small step at a time, because you can't do this over a long thing. Just the very notion of complexity is contrary to being able to make long term predictions. Yeah. But yes, uh, it's a very exciting time for education because yeah. it's a time of discovery by everybody concerned. So, as I often say, uh, I have no faith in the institutions or authorities. My faith is in the learners, the parents, the teachers. So they will take the transformation. They will make the changes because it will be driven by them. Not as rebel, but as evolving. It's the 20 is the method. 50% you are conforming, 20% you are preparing for yourself. You must have heard even in Google, they say all mm. Google employees are allowed to work for part of the time on things which fascinate them. Yeah. In company time, they can do things which they want to pursue. Yeah. So, so I like think 
the advantage is now we don't have to be rebels. I think by by that the whole picture, what I'm trying to say. It has that the done. Fight for this system sense. is better than that is not relevant. It's not so relevant anymore. You can you can because they say the life is about living with imperfections. This is a very important thing that we must appreciate that mm -hmm. life is about living with constraints, living yeah. with imperfections. And again, from a physics background, I did not say what is the gravitational constant. I did not fix what is the speed of light. I did not fix what is the boiling point of water. I did not fix what is the freezing point of ice. So yeah. these are a given. I have yeah. to navigate myself under these circumstances as best as I can. Absolutely. And like you rightly said, uh, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everybody turns to zero. Um, and there is a very interesting saying that with the benefit of hindsight, everybody's vision is 2020. <laughs> But now the challenge is we have to look at the next step and I'm saying exactly. don't look foresight, but only that much that you can do. So make it actionable. The little Absolutely. steps making the you know, getting up in the morning, your ikigai, determining for yourself what you are doing, why you are doing, what is the purpose of you in this, you know, being a dust speck of dust in this universe. I think we are all trying to find our purpose. So this is a great no, time. You are more than dust, you are biomolecules. <laughs> Exactly. So figuring that out, right? At this point, we haven't even figured out. We have reached the the moons and the masses, but we haven't really discovered what's inside of us. Yeah, but the so, moon, see, this is again, we are thinking the moon is something far away. That was hundreds of years. Today, the yeah. moon is a very small aspect. We've got so many more things that we could So many more. This is how the perspective changes. Exactly. See, there was a time when crying for the moon, the moon was far away. So today, you're going to have a round trip to the moon <laughs> available for... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks to Tesla. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but um, thank you so much. This is, uh, as always, so invigorating. Uh, I always find my Ikigai with you. I always uh, look up to you for guidance and for purpose. Uh, and I hope that through this interview, we'll be able to guide students, parents, teachers, educators to actually prepare for this new world order. Don't be in a rush to go back to what was normal. Uh, just think about what is worth going back to mm -hmm. and then, you know, prepare for what you needed to do and what, what the world needs. Okay, thank you. All the thank best. You so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.